Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in today. Eric here. Just want to make a few announcements. I am excited to announce a brand new podcast coming from myself. I will be narrating true stories of the weird, strange, macabre on a new podcast called Strange Chapters. It will debut on all podcasting platforms as well as YouTube on September 15th. So go to the Facebook page and like and follow and subscribe to the YouTube page. Also, we have our expo coming up in October, October 21st at the Nashville Fairgrounds, the Tennessee Haunts and Legends Expo. Tickets are on sale now. They are $10 uh, for adults. 12 and under are free. We have a full day of vendors and speakers for you. For more info, you can go to www.tnhauntsandlegendsexpo.com. And if you're interested in being a vendor, shoot us an email and request a vendor packet at tnhauntsandlegends at gmail.com. Also, we have another public ghost hunt coming up that uh, all the money will go to benefit the expo. And as y'all know, all the money from the expo is benefiting two awesome nonprofit organizations. The uh, public ghost hunt is at the Old Stone Jail in Franklin, Kentucky on September 2nd from 7 p.m. to 11 p.m. And you will get to investigate with myself, Lee from Medics for Paranormal, Regina and the team from PPF Investigations. Uh, tickets are $40. We will provide snacks and drinks. And that place is just amazing. We investigate the jail as well as the big uh, Simpson County Museum and Archives across the street. So we always have good activity there. We always have a fun time. And, it, you know, it's not scary. We teach you how to actually investigate and dispel a lot of rumors and myths and let you play with all the equipment and stuff. So it'll be a fun evening. And you can grab tickets. Uh, those links are on all the social medias as well for the Unseen Paranormal Podcast and for Medics for Paranormal and PPF. So hopefully we will see you soon, whether it's at the Ghost Hunt or coming up at the Expo in October. And thank you all for tuning in today. Enjoy this episode with Jerry Polly from Hillbilly Horror Stories. Y'all have a good day. Stay safe out there. Join us as we dive into the history, hauntings, and high strangeness of the world to try to better understand the paranormal. I will be your guide. I am paranormal researcher and investigator Eric Freeman Sims. Welcome to the Unseen Paranormal Podcast. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Unseen Paranormal. Thank you for joining us today. We are chatting with an amazing guest today. He is one of the hosts of Hillbilly Horror Stories, Jerry Polly. Hey, welcome to the show, Jerry. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, thanks for having me on, Eric. I appreciate it, brother. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's awesome because we just recorded for your show. We're doing back-to-back shows here, which is kind of fun. I don't, think, I don't think I've ever done this before where I've recorded for somebody's show and then recorded for mine, too. I've only done it once, and it was actually Monday of this week. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so history for both of us. But yeah, we met through Bob Hicks from Tales from the Dark. Um, Bob's yep. an awesome guy. I love networking the paranormal for that. I think the paranormal is just with people being so most of them being so awesome and stuff. It's it's awesome how uh, it seems like a big giant world of paranormal, but it's actually a pretty small circle once you get into it and networking with people and meeting people, and that's that's pretty neat. I love that. You see a lot of the negative coming from the paranormal, but it's usually from the bigger guys, the people from TV and and yeah. uh, the the quote unquote big shots in the paranormal world. They tend to bicker with each other, but the the smaller people like us that are that second tier, I would say, usually everybody's all about you know helping each other out as much as they can. Yeah, yeah, and you've probably gotten this too because just because you and Trace are exactly what you see on y'all show here on y'all show, you're the exact same people in person. Um, and I've gotten that from people when I've done conventions or festivals, I find that interesting that people come up and are like, Oh, you sound exactly like you do on your show. And they mean that not my voice necessarily, but that I'm the same person. Then I think mm -hmm. that's crazy that they, they think that, I don't know that we we're going to be different people, I guess, because of maybe they've had some experiences with some of those celebrities that were, you know, completely different. Maybe they're assholes or, you know, weren't very nice or something. It's possible. I, I know we did a live event one time and, you know, back then we would, you know, have somebody at the door that you know, would make sure that people had their tickets or what have you. And Tracy would be the one at the door. And then somebody <laughs> would come through and they're like, I can't believe you're the one up here checking tickets. I'm like, <laughs> you know, we're, we're not too good to check tickets. We're not, you know, we're not, yeah. we're nobody special. We're not going to be in a green room somewhere waiting. I mean, we're, when we do a live event, we are literally there 
as soon as you walk in and and fully available to anybody and anybody who does shows with us are the exact same way. You know, yeah. we list all of our tickets are as VIP tickets with full access. So you don't, you don't have to wait till somebody goes on stage to see them the first time. Yeah. Yeah. And I've also gotten messages from people. They'll message me like on my personal Facebook. That's it's public now. But, um, when I answer them back, they're like, I can't believe you're the one that answered me back. I'm like, no, it's just me. There's no team doing this show. I do everything. It's just me. Right. I am the Unseen Paranormal Podcast. Like, yeah, I, I just find some of those things are funny. But I think it comes from Hollywood, like you were saying. That's, you know, they they see those people on TV, and and yeah, it's just interesting uh, comments. Well, and I think I think some of the bigger podcasters kind of put those teams together, and I and I understand maybe when you get to a certain level that it would be overwhelming to try to answer everybody on top of doing your regular stuff. Cause yeah. you know, uh, there, there's a, a group, I won't say who it is, but they're a very popular podcast, but you know, I've been friends with the, the podcasters for since they started and, you know, I've always been able to just hit them up on social media. And then one time I hit them up and their quote unquote assistant answered me. And then <laughs> if we got into this conversation of, well, I'll tell so-and-so, and and I was like, that's just really weird, considering the fact that I've always been able to just reach out and talk to yeah. these people. And now I'm having to go through handlers and assistants. <laughs> and so I can understand how people might think if they're used to dealing with the, the big, 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 big names yeah. out there that maybe they're not going to talk to the people themselves. But, yeah, we get that all the time. Anytime we respond and we respond to everybody. If somebody yeah. writes us, we respond. If they leave a comment, we respond you know, thank you or well hearted or something. So we, we, nothing gets taken, uh, for granted. Trust me. Yeah. I try to be that way as well. Um, to respond to every comment or like you said, like it on it or heart it. And, and when people message me, yeah, I try to get back to them and, and give them an answer one way or the other. But, um, so you, you were a, a you I guess you call yourself semi-retired now, but you were a comedian for many, many years. Uh, how did you get into doing hillbilly horror stories? Cause you said the show's coming up on seven years. I call myself fully retired from okay. comedy because I can't imagine getting back up on stage again. I just, at this point, you know, I, I miss it a little bit, but I can't imagine getting back into it. And, and it actually goes into how Hillbilly Horror Stories got started. You know, if, if you've ever been in the comedy scene, uh, it's, it's a very grueling scene. Typically what happens, I'll walk you through the, the, uh, easy version. Typically what happens is you start showing up at your local club, you do some open mics. Eventually the person that does the booking there will maybe send you out to some places. They'll let you do some MC work, which you won't get paid anything for, by the way. Uh, <laughs> or if you do, it's like 50 bucks a weekend after you do seven shows, yeah. but you're doing it for the quote unquote experience. Then if you want to start really becoming the next level up, which is an opening act, you're going to have to go to other comedy clubs, probably within a three, four hour drive. And you offer to do quote unquote guest sets. Those are also free and your travel is for, you know, you know, you, you have to do a lot of traveling and, and basically try out for these places. Yeah. So you're giving them free work just in order to try to eventually get work in the end. So that's a lot of work. What I started doing was because after traveling and doing that for a while and becoming a headliner, I decided I didn't want to travel much anymore. So I started doing local shows and I had like, uh, basically like Ringo stars, all-star band, you know, yeah. I basically said, you know what? I'm going to set shows up within an hour or two hour radius of where I live. And I'm going to have invite other comedians in and we'll have six, seven comedians and everybody will get 10 minutes. And then I'll do my hour at the end of it. Everybody has a great time. I was making good money doing that, you know, not like Dave Chappelle money, right. obviously, but you know, I'd, I'd make seven, eight, nine hundred dollars a night. And I only had to do it like on the weekends when I wanted yeah. to one show, instead of, you know, three a night, I would do one show and it worked out good for me. But it was still a lot of headache and people don't realize if you're not the big name, the Dave Chappelle's the Kevin Hart's, you don't just spend some spare time writing, show up and go up, do it and be done. You literally had to go to the bars or the restaurants and set these things up. Then you had to get all the other comedians. You had to run the tickets. You had to sell everything. You had to set your equipment up when you got there. Cause most of these places didn't have equipment, you know, and all that stuff takes its toll. 
I loved being on stage, hated the other aspects of it. It got to be really a, a, a grind. Yeah. And, you know, I said, I said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to stop. And I would stop. And two months later, I would miss being on stage because anybody who tells you they get into entertainment for any other reason than the attention you get on stage <laughs> is just lying to you. Right. That's just the way it is. And I would miss it. I'd always get sucked back into doing it. And eventually I, I heard some podcasters. I started listening to Lore. It was my first podcast that I really started listening to. And then I started listening to real ghost stories online with Tony and Jenny Bruski and they were a husband and wife team. And I thought, you know what? There's a little comedy mixed in here. I didn't think I could do because I, once again, I don't have a voice like you do. I don't have the writing ability like Aaron Mankey yeah. of lore. And I was like, you know what? I don't think I can do that. I can't do a me set there and script this out. But when I heard Tony and Jenny and they were pretty much just conversational going back and forth, I thought, you know, now something like that I think I can do. And Tracy, I told Tracy about it, and she wanted to be a part of the show. And I told her immediately no, because she basically had no interest in the paranormal whatsoever. <laughs> so I couldn't see that working. But there was a guy I worked with named Ricky. We used to talk about the paranormal all the time, and he absolutely loved it. And we had great stories. I thought, that's my co-host right there. Yeah. So I talked to Ricky. He said he was in. Uh, I went out and ordered all the wrong equipment because I had no clue what I was doing. And two weeks later, we started the podcast. And I, I started it with doing 20 minutes at a time because I thought that's all anybody would want to listen to us. You know, it's a fast-paced world. Nobody wants to spend an hour, and that, that was my attitude. Right. Uh, after a couple of episodes, people were like, I wish you'd do longer episodes. And I'm like, I didn't foresee that happening. <laughs> but when Ricky and I started, it was a very adult-rated uh, show i mean it was yeah. you know my comedy was more along the lines of uh andrew dice clay and eddie murphy and richard pryor and chris rock that's the kind of comedians i looked up to and that was my act and the show was based the same way so there was a lot of cursing and you know what have you in the show and um after eight episodes ricky said he had a stomach virus he couldn't make it for the ninth i didn't want to miss an episode so tracy had to fill in she didn't know anything that I was going to be talking about. So I said, just respond. And it just so happens that episode, that's what I had done anyway. Even, even though Ricky and I would split stuff up, he would do part of the show. I would do part for this episode. I actually had done everything. And Ricky was just going to respond that night. It wouldn't have made a difference yeah. if he just showed up. And Tracy just listened. She responded. People really liked it. Ricky really liked it and said, you know what? She needs to be your host. And I said, nah, she'll be a good fill in. You know, you come on back. And we did two more episodes. And then Ricky said, you know what? I got a lot going on in life and you guys have a rapport. I think it would work out better. And so Tracy took over on episode 12 and that was literally seven years ago. Wow. Yeah. I actually discovered your show when it first came out. And I think whenever Bob introduced us, I was like, yeah, I've been listening to your show before Tracy was, was the co-host. And uh, yeah, I remember those first few uh, episodes. And then, uh, and then when Tracy come in, I love Tracy. She just, her comments, she's just funny and just naturally a funny, lighthearted person. And, uh, yeah, I think y'all's dynamic is, is just amazing on the show. And, uh, I think that's, that's why you've had so much success with it is, is the two of y'all and the story, the stories are great too. And the production y'all's production is really good. But, uh, yeah, I think just the genuineness, I think that's what people want is, is for us to be genuine. And uh, that just shows through on Hillbilly Horror Stories really, really well. Yeah, I think you're 100% right. The fact that she doesn't know the story every week, so she gives her genuine uh, reactions. And a lot of times it's the same thing that the listeners are thinking. Yeah. So when she asks a question, it's like, oh, I was thinking the same thing. And I think that that resonates with people. And, uh, you know, we, we're we an open book, uh, Eric. We don't we, – everything that goes on with us medically, deaths in the family, uh, we just – you know, our, our dog that was part of the show for, from the, the beginning to set it on every single episode we recorded, uh, died back in March. And, you know, we cried together and our listeners cried with us and, you know, we don't hold back. Everybody knew who our dog was. Everybody got used to hearing him snoring in the background and, you yeah. know, it was never an issue. And, you know, we listened to a, uh, big fans of a show here in town called Kentucky sports radio. And they are the most successful 
show and a sports show in the entire country as far as audience wise, as far as being, you know, to a certain sports team. Yeah. And it's based on University of Kentucky sports. There's no no show like them in the country. And the reason is there are four hosts on that show and they are open books as well. They literally, we know everything about every one of them, who they're married to, when they got divorced, uh, things like that. They don't keep anything private. Yeah. And we used that as a, as a blueprint when we started the show, I told Tracy, I said, they're, they're very successful for a reason. And it's because everybody can resonate with them. And I said, we're going to be the exact same way. And I mean, Tracy's lost her father uh, since we've done this. Like I said, we've lost our dog. We've had, I've had uh, open heart surgery after the first episode, you know, and then then I've I've had that medical situation back in uh, January where I literally uh, flatlined for two minutes on the table. And I mean, every bit of this stuff gets discussed. Yeah, and uh, you know it's 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 amazing the audience we've got you know we've got over twenty four million downloads and those are come from all over the world and we Tracy when our dog died we were getting stuff uh, uh, grievance cards and stuff like that in the mail from all over the world for you know weeks yeah. after the fact and you know people were bringing us stuff to live shows you know uh, little memorial plaques and you know you just can't explain what that means to, to know that you mean that much to people where they think of you as family. Yeah. And you become so big a part of their lives that they, yeah, that they think of you that way. That's, that's amazing to have that type of audience and to have that connection with your audience is, is amazing. Uh, so how did you get interested in the paranormal to begin with? Did you have any experiences when you were younger? Cause I know a lot of us in the paranormal world have, or, or what got your, your interest going in the paranormal? I just saw how much money Zach Baggins was making and thought, you know, maybe I can. <laughs> no, uh, I actually grew up, I, not grew up. We moved into a haunted house when I was 13 years old. And for about five years, we had a bunch of paranormal experiences inside the house that I lived in. And I think, you know, looking back, I do. I realized when I was about five or six years old, I actually, there was another house we lived in that had some stuff going on. But I didn't realize it back then until I obviously became later in life. I realized that some of those experiences were paranormal, but mainly living in that house from 13 to 18 years old. I lived there longer than that, but all the occurrences seemed like it happened in a five-year period. And I think that's what really kicked off my interest in the paranormal. And of course, back then, you know, you would see some paranormal stuff on TV around Halloween time or right. something like that. But there really wasn't much on television, you know, other than the horror movies and stuff around. And of course the exorcist was my favorite movie. So that probably didn't hurt things back then, but yeah, yeah it was, it was my own experiences that really kicked everything off. Yeah. That's, I think that most of us, that's how we get into the paranormal, whatever part of the paranormal you're in. I, uh, I saw a full body apparition when I was eight. And that kind of kicked me in. And then I became the weird kid at school when we had book fairs. <laughs> I was going looking for the Bigfoot alien books, ghost books, you know, anything I could find paranormal. Cause that was before the internet was a big thing. And, and, uh, I'm kind of on the edge of that generation where, you know, when I was growing up, we really didn't have the internet until I was in high school. And so, and before the ghost shows and all that stuff, but, uh, y'all travel around doing live events at different places. And so it, it lets you go to, Lots of different haunted locations. What would you say is some of your favorite haunted locations that you've been to and gotten to experience uh, things? Obviously, Waverly is is near the top of the list. Bobby Mackey's in Wilder, Kentucky, right across the bridge from Cincinnati. Uh, we've, we've done, I think, four live shows inside Bobby Mackey's when they were closed down. Uh, and and that place is just off the charts crazy. It's uh, it's absolutely awesome. I took Tracy there on, for Valentine's Day before way before we started doing the show. This probably was about 12, 13 years ago. And I took her there for Valentine's Day. Uh, it was like a Thursday or something, but it was during during the day. There was a snowstorm moving in, and we got a tour with two, uh, two other people. So it was a, pretty close to a private tour because that's how I roll. I take her haunted places on Valentine's Day. And... <laughs> we had some experiences there that day. So when it came time to doing the show, I was like, man, that's a place I'd really like to do something inside. You know, a lot of the shows that we do, 
we uh, we don't get to do them inside the haunted locations, you know, yeah. and we, we we're trying to make that more and more like we got to do a live show in Atchison, Kansas, and that's where the Sally House is. And we actually spent the night in a Sally House, but we couldn't do the show there. We did the show in a haunted restaurant that was uh, right there in Atchison. But we did get to spend the night in a Sally House. That was really cool. I didn't have a ton of stuff happen. Tracy had a little bit of stuff happen. But I have a, the, uh, an issue where every time I spend the time in a haunted location, it's like they, they duck and dodge me or something. I don't get a lot <laughs> of stuff happen. Now, the Whispers Estate in Indiana is where I've experienced the most paranormal uh, happenings. And I mean, there was stuff that the first two hours we were there, there was so much stuff that happened that that was probably more than every other place I've ever been combined. Yeah. You know, like I said, a little bit in the Sally house, Bobby Mackey's and Waverly. You can't go to either one of those places without experiencing something. Yeah. You're just going to, it's just the way that it is. Uh, we're getting ready to do a show on, um, September 2nd, Labor Day weekend at the Bell Mansion up in Fort Wayne, Indiana. So that's when we actually are doing a live show inside the location. And we're excited about that because the people who come to that show, they're going to get the live show with us in mysterious circumstances, but they're also going to get a tour and they're going to get an investigation from 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. No, oh, that's awesome. So yeah. that you know, that's one of the few times where you get the an investigation and a tour and a show all together. It's gonna be a long day. Yeah. But uh yeah, that's that's the first time where we've had all that together. So have you ever considered investigating or or getting into the investigation world? I did when I was young. I actually was part of the uh Louisville Ghost Hunter Society with Keith Age uh up in up in Louisville. And I don't I don't have the patience for it. Uh, you know, uh, this sounds, this is going to sound stupid for somebody who's into the paranormal like I am, but I'm almost like, once you see some flashlights turn off and on, and it's been proven to you that there is an afterlife and it's been proven that there are spirits that can make something happen. Yeah. To me, it doesn't matter if that happens in the tower of London or, or if it happens at whispers of state, or if it happens at octagon hall, it's just like, I get tired of it really quick. So when I investigate, I go somewhere, you know, with a, with a, usually a group. I let them do all the fun stuff, all the investigating, and I just tag along. And and if we start at nine by eleven, I'm ready to leave and go home. Whether <laughs> I've seen something or not, it's like, yeah, that's enough for me. And yeah. I definitely don't have the patience to sit and listen to all the audio and cover all the footage. That's the stuff that's so boring to me that, you know, I would miss so much stuff because I would be like watching it and playing on my phone at the same time. <laughs> you wouldn't want me in charge of the video or the audio. <laughs> yeah, it, it does get tedious at times, but when you get those big pieces of evidence, it I think it makes it all worthwhile. Um, the hours to sit and listen to audio, and then you get a clear voice or watching video and you catch a shadow figure or something. Yeah, yeah. It's I have ADD, so it, it, it's hard for me to, to sit down and do that too, and I have to be make sure that I keep myself focused and don't have things within reach that I can kind of fidget with and things. But, uh, but yeah, evidence review, uh, my investigative partners, they do more of that than I do just cause the ADD just doesn't allow me to do it. Right. But, uh, <laughs> it, it, y'all, y'all cover all different kinds of stories on hillbilly horror stories from missing persons and, and all different kinds of stuff. What are you, what is your favorite part of the paranormal? Cause I'm a, my forte is ghost. Um, and of course, you know, I talk to other people and I've, I've researched, cryptids and Bigfoot and Loch Ness monster and all those things and time slips. But what are, what are your favorite stories and what's your favorite part of the paranormal to, to talk about and tell stories about? It's definitely got to be ghost or poltergeist. I think poltergeist activity to, to narrow it down would probably be the stuff that I like talking about the most, because I think, I think there's so many things that can go into that, whether you think it's a, a spirit because yeah. obviously poltergeist is German. It translates loosely to noisy ghosts. But in most cases, as we've learned, poltergeist is more done uh, from maybe a young teen going through puberty or yeah. or, or a tumultuous time at home, uh, a lot of stress, pressure, stuff like that. So I think I think because of the fact that that's more done mentally, yeah, I think more than uh, spiritually, that fascinates me. Something about that just fascinates me. And I love these stories to where like the uh, uh, the case up in uh, Connecticut, I think it was, 
drawn a blank on the the street, but uh, nine six six Lindley, that one. I think it's awesome because you've got all these firemen and police officers that are verifying what they see, like a, yeah. a refrigerator that weighs a ton, you know, lifting off the ground and spinning in the air while policemen and firemen are looking at it and a talking cat yeah. and, you know, a cat that sings jingle bells and all this stuff. Those stories are the ones that fascinate me that have a lot of uh, credible witnesses. Yeah. And, you know, but I've said a thousand times, I'm not a Bigfoot guy. You know, I know there's so many people that are interested and I believe in Bigfoot. I don't, I'm not, I'm, I would never say it doesn't exist. I do believe it exists just like aliens. I believe aliens exist. And I think we're all being proved that uh, recently, right. but neither one of them fascinate me that much. Now I will have the occasional story on either subject, like Ape Canyon. I think Ape Canyon is a fascinating story. And I love that story, you know, yeah. uh, Bogey, Bogey Creek. Uh, I think that's a fantastic story. So, yeah, there are definitely uh, uh, Momo from uh, Missouri. Those are are stories that I think are fantastic. I have trouble with, like, the Loveland frogs and, you know, <laughs> yeah. stuff like that. I, I don't know. Uh, yeah. The Flatwoods monster has always been one that's never fascinated me that a lot of people just love. Uh, Mothman, on the other hand, I love the whole Mothman deal. You know, and you so uh, it's hit or miss of me when it comes to cryptids. Uh, I need to do more of those. They, I tend to not do as many, and I don't do as many UFO stories, mainly because I just don't get as fascinated by them. But like I said, like the Berkshire UFO or Travis Walton story, you know, stories like that when, you know, they do fascinate me. And those are the more types of stories that end up on the show. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm fascinated by poltergeist as well, like you're saying, because there's so many different facets to that, that sometimes it may be a ghost um, apporting things and moving things. But, yeah, it's typically, you know, it's typically teenage girls and, you know, psychokinetic powers, which um, also shows that we have more things that we can do, more senses than we realize. I've gone down the rabbit hole of, of Bigfoot and aliens. Aliens, I'm with you. It just doesn't really fascinate me as much as a lot of the other things. Um, here lately, kind of time slips have been uh, the rabbit hole I've gone down. That just Because I think with time slips, it can explain a lot in the paranormal. Um, and it doesn't oh, explain yeah, like everything. Matrix stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, with the time slip. And I tell people, even with Bigfoot, like, you know, time slips could could make a lot of sense if we're seeing a, a time slip of a creature that lived, you know, thousands of years ago. And, and they're like, well, well, how do you mean that? And I'm like, well, if you see a bear in the woods, you don't go up and poke it in the ass to see if it's real. You just assume that it's really there in front of you and you're going to go the other way, <laughs> you know? So, um, but yeah, time slips have been a big thing of mine here lately. But yeah, some of those, some of those individual stories about those houses, like infield poltergeist, and some of those in individual houses are really fascinating. Andyville horror I find fascinating because I don't know. It's hard to tell if it's real or not. Did they trump it up for book money and movies? You know, and I don't know what to think about the Warrens. And it's blasphemy to say anything bad about the Warrens in this field. But, you know, I don't, because they got a book deal out of it. And the people that's lived in Amityville, the people that live there now, nobody's ever reported any other, you know, activity except for the um, Lutz family. But I find those cases interesting because it's a, it's, you got the true crime element, which I'm a huge fan of too. And when it crosses over the paranormal, I find that just fascinating where the true crime is kind of the direct cause of the, mm -hmm. of the paranormal. But yeah, some of those individual houses do, do uh, the Sally house, you know, Velisca Axe murder house. Those stories are, are definitely interesting. It's funny you mentioned the Warrens because I've been critical of the Warrens on this show before. Uh, I've not been overly critical and called them frauds, but at the same time, I do think that they um, took advantage of certain situations that were yeah. in front of them. And I'm not saying that, you know, right, wrong. It's just the way that it is. And some people do that, you know, if it's a situation's there and they can find a way to jazz it up a little bit to, to, to get a little more off of it. But, you know, I talked to their grandson, um, here about a month and a half ago, and he actually is, uh, and his name escapes me, so it's driving me crazy until I think of it, but he actually is head of the Warren Legacy Foundation Group for the Paranormal. Yeah. And 
we talked and I was very upfront with him. Look, I'm not going to bring you on and, and talk to you and not at least come forward and be honest and say that I've, you know, I have brought up that, that I didn't always think that your grandparents had the best of intentions right. uh, for the, for the victims. And uh, so we, we talked about it a little bit. And like I said, he was very, very nice guy. And, and, I, and I think he's out there doing good work right now, but yeah, so I, I've always felt that way about the Warrens. I just, you know, because you know, Lorraine wasn't a medium when they started. Yeah. And Ed's a self proclaimed demonologist. So right. he kind of just did all this self. And it just, I just, if you're not a medium, I mean, I'm not saying that can't happen because, you know, maybe you've got some, some inner abilities and maybe you've just shied away from it your whole life. And you, you know, but you, you can't just make yourself a medium, you right. know, and so. I don't know, but that's, that was just always my whole thing. And when you hear stories like the Amityville horror and you hear them talking about, you know, that the Warrens told them, ah, well, just make up the rest of it. You know, yeah. I don't think the guy had any reason to lie about it. It just makes him look bad. Right. You know, I just, you know, who knows, but I don't know. Um, but then I've heard different stuff, obviously about the Lutzes afterwards. I interviewed a gentleman that knew George Lutz really well. And he, he claims George had some powers and he claims that George was doing some stuff in that house that um, some spells and stuff that he probably shouldn't have that probably let something in. And yeah. maybe that's why there's nothing after they left. Maybe it went with them. You know? Right. Right. Yeah. And I, I've had uh, Andrea Perrin on the show. And she's from, you know, grew up in the conjuring house and that whole thing happened to her family. And, uh, she would not say anything bad about the Warrens, which is fine. Um, but she also in a roundabout way said they're full of shit, uh, because their version of what happened in the conjuring house to her mother was completely different than they said that they were called in. The parent family never contacted them. It was, uh, right. Uh, Keith Johnson, I believe that was in with the Warrens. He actually contacted them. And the second time they knocked on the door, you know, her dad threw them out and said, don't ever come back. And I think he almost punched uh, one of them in the face, uh, one of their group in the face, because they were insisting on coming back in the house. She said, she says that eventually though, he ended up punching Ed in the face when they were doing yeah. the uh, seance downstairs in the basement area or whatever, yeah. because she, he was telling them to stop and they kept going. And so it became violent down there. So yeah, yeah. it's like, it's, it's like, so we had Andrea on too, and she doesn't say anything bad about him, but she makes it clear that some of the stuff <laughs> yeah. definitely wouldn't as it was shown. Yeah. Yeah. She, she's an awesome lady too. She's a sweetheart. I've been yeah. on her show as well. And just a great, great lady. But, uh, yeah, I find it. I was also told by somebody when I started, um, doing the podcast and my podcast started gaining some popularity, uh, somebody off the record and I won't say who told me, um, the two people you don't talk smack about or that you'll get blacklisted is don't talk bad about Zach Baggins or the Warrens. And I'm like, Oh, Oh, so you, what you want me to say is that every show I'm going to talk smack about both of them now, because I am up to the challenge. They would, they're going to blacklist me from what, how are they going to block my listeners from hearing me? You know, <laughs> like, so I just thought that was funny that I got that advice about the podcast. I'm like, all right. Yeah, I'd be in rough shape because I've definitely, I've definitely said negatives about both Zach on a yeah. regular basis. So, oh yeah, 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 <laughs> me too. And every guest that I've mentioned his name, they talk smack about him too. So, uh, and the whole demon thing. Uh, what do you think about the whole demon satanic panic part two that we're, we're we have going on now? I don't know. It's uh, you know, I get so frustrated with everything being a demon, everything you look at on, on, on uh video wise, whether it be TikTok or whatever, it's, it's always got to be 3 AM or it's got to be demon or it's got to be, you know, so why can't spirits just be assholes and, right. and leave it at that. Right. And I think that, you know, I think more times than that's what it is. Do I believe that there's some type of demon, demonic entities? Yes. Do I think they happen as common as they try to make it? No. I mean, every time something is at least a little bit negative, it gets branded a demon these days, and it's just not the case. Yeah, it's it's all ratings stuff. Um, I just had a demonologist on, uh, Rich Valdez. Um, he's on the Travel Channel show, uh, Eli Roth Presents Legion of Exorcist. Mm -hmm. And um, I had been looking for somebody for so long to talk about demonology and, and the real deal, and he's the real deal with the the old Catholic Church of the United States. He's their demonologist. And, and yeah, that's what he said. He's like, in the paranormal, when you're investigating, it's few and far between in the general world. He's like, I deal with it more because people, who do people go to for things like that? The church. So he's like, yeah, we hear about it all the time, but he's like, you can get tunnel vision 
even in being a demonologist that, you know, it happens more than it actually does. But yeah, I just, it's like, yeah, satanic panic part two. Um, in the eighties you had, you know, some murders that they convicted the kids just because they thought they were devil worshipers. And yeah, West Memphis three. Yeah. Been exonerated and, and freed. But, uh, yeah, I was, I was, uh, I'm friends with, uh, Bishop James Long and he's obviously yeah. an exorcist and demonologist as well. And he had posted something, heck, probably maybe a month ago where it was like, people, please quit referring to everything as demons. It's, you know, it's hurtful to people and it could cause some damage somewhere along the line. You just can't refer to everything bad in life as demonic. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, it's, 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 people are starting to speak out more and more. Yeah. And Rich, he, he's the demonologist for James Long. Uh, James Long's kind of his boss. But yeah, so telling all these stories and reading all these stories, has it changed your beliefs in the paranormal in different aspects? Or, I mean, because you've done so many now over seven years, has it shaped different opinions on, in different areas of the paranormal? The only place it's really, because I was 100% believer when we started the show. I've had stuff enough happen where I wasn't skeptical. Yeah. Now, does that mean I believe everybody's story? No, because right. you just can't. But I, I know it exists, and that's all I need. You know, and the one thing, the only thing that it's changed is my opinion of reincarnation, because I don't think I believed in reincarnation. And now I've researched and went down the rabbit hole on so many different stories yeah. that now I am 100 percent a believer in reincarnation. So that's the one thing that's changed. Yeah. Yeah. And there's some amazing scientific studies out there. Uh, from some doctors, some psychiatrists, psychologists. Yeah, there's some amazing stuff um, studying kids all over the world that know mm -hmm. things about past lives they shouldn't. They can pinpoint names and dates and wh where they were killed, when they were killed. And, yeah, these kids shouldn't know any of that. Um, what Do you think it's uh, – because you said when you all first started doing the show, Tracy really wasn't into the paranormal at all. Has she gotten more into the paranormal and the stories and, and kind of got the bug for it? She loves the stories. Will you ever catch her just reading up on a paranormal story on her own? No. <laughs> um, but she definitely has more of an interest now. She loves going to the uh, locations that we go to. And uh, so that that part of it has definitely changed uh, for her. But And, and, and yeah, she'll, she'll flip on one of these uh, specials on TV or something, a haunting or something like that, and, and she'll watch that. Uh, but not as much as she would, you know, a uh, thousand pound sisters or my 600 <laughs> yeah. pound life. She hoarders. She loves, she loves reality TV, buddy, but she knows not to turn on ghost adventures. That's a quick way to get the uh, TV privileges suspended, <laughs> <laughs> but no, but no, she's definitely way more interested than she was back in the day. And she's, you know, I can tell her these stories and, you know, it's funny after doing all these, these stories that we, we, we sit down every week, multiple times and I'll, and I'll tell these stories. She's still just as interested in hearing them as yeah. she was in the beginning. So. Yeah. Yeah. And I think uh, the, the storytelling aspect, I think it's awesome to have podcasts like yours and I'm starting the new podcast where I'm going to be narrating stories because coming from Appalachia, that's where a lot of the folklore and storytelling kind of started. And to keep that tradition going, I think is important. And so I think that's why podcasts like yours that do a lot of stories also, I think it gives validity to those people that the stories happen to, and it gives them a voice mm -hmm. to say, you know, you're not crazy and they can, and even, even normal people can come and listen to a show like yours and say, oh, well that's happened to me. And I thought I was crazy or I was seeing things, but I'm hearing this story that happened to somebody else. And so it kind of validates. So I think, yeah, shows like yours are very important to keep that storytelling alive, but also to validate other people's experiences and, and make them know that, um, like I said, that they're not crazy and that they, there actually is things out there that, uh, that maybe their families don't talk about or, or they got suppressed when they were younger because their parents said, no, there's, you know, you didn't see anything in your closet when they really did. Uh, but yeah, I think, I think Hillbilly Horror Stories definitely has a important place in, in the world of the paranormal for sure. Yeah. We try to, we try to keep it. We used to advertise the show as serious enough for the true paranormal fan but but also fun enough for a skeptic to listen to and enjoy. So yeah. that's kind of what we we want we want everybody to listen, even if you don't believe. We got a lot of listeners that just they don't believe in the paranormal at all, but they just enjoy the show. So yeah. I'll take it. Yeah, they enjoy y'all and they enjoy the good storytelling. 
So what do y'all have coming up uh, here? We're we're starting to get into spooky season. Everybody's itching for Halloween and fall. So what do y'all have coming up for the rest of the year? Uh, I don't know when this will air, but August 19th, we're going to be in Detroit for our seventh anniversary live event with Brohio and uh, uh, Justin Rimmel from Mysterious Circumstances. And then two weeks later on Memorial Day or uh, Labor Day weekend on the second, we'll be at the Bell Mansion up there for that event. And then on the 30th of September, which is actually Tracy and I's wedding anniversary, we will be doing a live event in Gatlinburg, Tennessee with Tony Merkel from the confessionals. Oh, awesome. And, um, and then we're doing Cryptid Con, which will be uh, the, the Saturday and Sunday before Thanksgiving in November in Lexington. And that'll wrap up the year for us. That's awesome. Where can people find tickets if they want to come see y'all? Hillbillyhorrorstories.com. You can get information on all those things. Tickets are available there. Uh, you can get an autographed copy of my book, which has uh, been out for about three years now. And we do a cruise, a uh, Hillbilly Horror Story cruise, which will be September of next year. Uh, but you can find out information about that, too. Oh, that sounds like a lot of fun. We did one last year, and it was a blast. So we're going to do it every other year. It's too much to do one uh, every year. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, it works out good because the way we do it, we usually announce it in February. you got a year and a half. You can make payments on it. But, you know, your standard room for two people is like 1100 bucks. So yeah. you can pay 100 bucks a month over the course of 12, 13 months, and, and it's paid for, and you're ready to go. And this one's going to be five days out of Galveston, going to two stops in Mexico and back to Galveston. That sounds like a lot of fun, just a whole five days of paranormal in paradise. <laughs> yeah, and you get, uh, you get like, we do live shows on there. We did one, the one we did last year went from Miami to um, the Bahamas and back. And we did, uh, we had a live show with us and two other shows. And then we had uh, a meet and greet one other day, and we had a cocktail party that was all included. So you get all that. And then when we have... Uh, dinner we are we're all seated together we had our own section of the dining room so it really is a, a fun cruise but then you get all the paranormal stuff involved with it too yeah and also get to you know actually pick your brain in person <laughs> and and rub elbows with you and tracy at the pool <laughs> well not that that's anything special trust me <laughs> but uh... <laughs> well i thank you for coming on today jerry i had an awesome conversation and it's great to meet you you know, uh, through zoom here <laughs> and, uh, hopefully we'll get to meet in person sometime soon. It's been a blast. You're, you're close enough where that should happen. Yeah. Yeah. And we would love to have you all at the expo in October. Let me, uh, let me check the thing. We got UK football season tickets for the first time ever. And as long as there's not a game that day, yeah. I think we can make that happen. Yeah. Somebody told me, uh, why did you pick the day that Tennessee and Alabama are playing? And I'm like, I, that wasn't on my radar when, when we booked the, the Nashville convention you know nashville fairgrounds expo so uh well trust me that's something i learned with live events I, we don't do any live events in march because being in kentucky yeah. you could pick a saturday where you got final four games going on or march madness and nobody's coming to your <laughs> event if that's the case and it's in kentucky so we learned yeah. that we don't start uh we don't start until april and then uh, I screwed up, and when we set this uh, Bell Mansion thing up, it's the first game of the year, the first time I ever have season tickets, and I set up a live event the very first game, and I'm like, I cannot believe it. But normally I look at that stuff, but I screwed up this time and didn't do it. <laughs> well, hopefully for our expo, you know, there's enough people around Nashville that's not uh, UT or Alabama fans that will come out. or It's from 9 to 6, so hopefully you can come out before or after the game, you know. And you're probably going to have a lot of people from around the area that's yeah. not even, you know, I know we do a live event. We average about 13 different states that show up. So yeah. I'd imagine for a con, you're going to end up with the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. And we're trying to build it into building a community in the Southeast because you have all these big cons and expos and things like up in New England and, and other places around, but we don't have anything big like that here. So we're trying to connect all the community together and get, Everybody from the paranormal, from the metaphysical to the pagans to the witches to the investigators to teams to podcasts and just trying to get everybody together. And hopefully we can make it a an every year thing uh, that we do in October. Really cool. All right, Jerry. Thank you so much for coming on today. Everybody go check out Hillbilly Horror Stories if you have not. I don't know how you haven't if you listen to, to Paranormal Podcasts. Amazing show. And uh, y'all stay safe out there. Have a good day. We'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to The Unseen Paranormal. Join me next Wednesday with a brand new guest 
And please rate, review, share, and subscribe on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you're listening right now. This helps more people discover the show. You can connect with me over on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or join us in the Unseen Paranormal Lounge group on Facebook. Until next time, remember, some of the scariest things are unseen. Unseen.